Chapter One of Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Seven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Seven, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter One: The Enrollment and the Draft. The successive steps by which the Army of the United States, numbering some 17,000 men when Mr. Lincoln was inaugurated, grew to the vast aggregate of a million soldiers, deserve a word of notice. We can do no more than to summarize briefly the process, referring those of our readers who may wish to study the matter in more detail to the admirable historical statement of General James B. Fry, appended to the report of the Secretary of War to the 39th Congress. The first troops mustered into the service were the militia of the District of Columbia. Thirty-eight companies were thus obtained. On the 15th of April was issued, under the law of 1795, the President's proclamation calling for 75,000 troops for 90 days. Their work was the protection of the capital. Their service mainly ended with the First Battle of Bull Run. On the 3rd of May, the President issued a call for 42,000 volunteers to serve three years, unless sooner discharged. He increased at the same time the regular army by eight regiments, and directed the enlistment of 18,000 seamen. This was done without authority from Congress, but the act was legalized when that body came together. The volunteers called for were immediately raised, and many more were offered, but the recruits for the regular army came in slowly, and the new regiments were in fact never fully organized until the close of the war. After the disastrous Battle of Bull Run, the patriotism of Congress promptly rose to the emergency, and within a few days successive acts were passed, giving the President authority to raise an army of a million men. So enthusiastic was the response of the people in those early days that the chief embarrassment of the government at first was to check and repress the offers of volunteers. Some regions were more liberal in their tenders of troops than others. Individuals and companies rejected from one state whose quota was full enlisted from another. Pious frauds were practiced to get a place under the colors. Much confusion and annoyance afterwards resulted from those causes. Under authority of the Acts of Congress referred to, a force of 637,126 men was in the service in the spring of 1862. This, it was thought, would be adequate for the work of suppressing the insurrection. The expenses of the military establishment had risen to appalling proportions, and the ill-advised resolution was taken of putting a stop to volunteer recruiting on the 3rd of April. As the waste of the armies went on without corresponding successes, the error which had been committed was recognized, and recruiting was resumed in June. But before much progress was made, the ill fortune of McClellan in the peninsula, and its unfavorable effect on the public mind, chilled and discouraged recruitment. The necessity for more troops was as evident to the country as to the government. While General McClellan was on his retreat to the James, the governors of the loyal states signed a letter to the president requesting him to issue a call for additional troops and it was in response to this that mr lincoln issued his call on the second of july eighteen sixty two for three hundred thousand volunteers the need of troops continuing and becoming more and more pressing the call for three hundred thousand nine months militia was issued on the fourth of august and in some of the states a draft from the militia was ordered the results of which were not especially satisfactory only about 87,000 of the 300,000 required were reported as obtained in this way, and this number was greatly reduced by desertion before the men could be got out of their respective states. In Pennsylvania, a somewhat serious organization was formed in several counties for resisting the draft. General Curtin reported several thousand recusants in arms. They would not permit the drafted men who were willing to go to their duty to leave their homes and even force them to get out of the railway trains after they had embarked. By the prompt and energetic action of the state and national governments working in harmony, this disorder was soon suppressed. But there, as elsewhere, the enrollment was inefficient and the results entirely inadequate. Early in the year 1863, it became evident that the armies necessary for an effective prosecution of the war could not be filled by volunteering, nor by state action alone, and a bill for enrolling and calling out the national forces was introduced in the Senate in the beginning of February, and at once gave rise in that body to a hot discussion. It was attacked by the Democratic senators, who were mostly from the border states, with the greatest energy and feeling. They contended that it was in direct violation of the Constitution, and, if passed, would be subversive to the liberties of the country. 
they were joined by william a richardson who had succeeded mr douglas as senator from illinois and who warned his colleagues that they were plunging the country into civil war the bill was principally defended by henry wilson of massachusetts and jacob Colomer of vermont the former laying most stress upon the necessities of the country and the latter characteristically advocating the measure on legal and constitutional grounds the bill passed the senate and came up in the house on the twenty third of february abram b olin who had charge of it announced at the beginning with a somewhat crude candor that he proposed to permit discussion of the merits of the bill for a reasonable time and then to demand a vote upon it he was not willing to hazard the loss of a bill he deemed so important by opening it to propositions for amendment but in spite of this warning perhaps by reason of it an animated discussion at once sprang up and many amendments were offered some in good faith and some with the purpose of nullifying the bill the measure was attacked with great violence the object and purpose of the president was proclaimed by democratic members to be the establishment of an irresponsible despotism and the destruction of constitutional liberty was prophesied as certain in case the bill should pass there was a great difference of tone between the opponents and the supporters of the administration the latter confident in their strength were far more moderate in their expressions than the former but there were reproaches and recriminations on both sides democrats like mr cox of ohio mr biddle of pennsylvania and messrs mallory and wycliffe of kentucky claimed that the anti-slavery measures of the administration were the sole cause of military failure and that if the president would return to constitutional ways the armies would soon be filled by volunteering to which the republicans answered that the secession of volunteering was due to the treasonable speech and conduct of the opposition some unimportant amendments were attached to the bill which was sent back to the senate for concurrence and after another debate scarcely less passionate than the first the amendments of the house were adopted and the measure became law by the approval of the president on the third of march eighteen sixty three this was the first law enacted by congress by which the government of the united states without the intervention of the authorities of the several states appealed directly to the nation to create large armies the act declared that with certain exceptions especially set forth all able-bodied male citizens and persons of foreign birth who had declared their intention to become citizens between the ages of twenty and forty-five should constitute the national forces and empower the president to call them forth by draft all were to be called out if necessary the first call was actually for one-fifth but that was a measure of expediency the act provided for the appointment or detail by the president of a provost marshal general who was to be the head of a bureau in the war department and for dividing the states into districts coinciding with those for the election of congressmen the district of columbia and the territories formed additional districts a provost marshal was authorized for each of these districts with whom was associated a commissioner and a surgeon the board thus formed was required to divide its district into as many sub-districts as might be found necessary to appoint an enrolling officer for each and to make an enrollment immediately colonel james b fry an assistant adjutant general of the army who had formerly been chief of staff to general Buell, and who was not only an accomplished soldier but an executive offer of extraordinary tact ability and industry was made provost marshal general officers of the army selected for their administrative capacity were appointed provost marshals for the several states the enrollment began the latter part of may and was pushed forward with great energy except in the border states where there was some difficulty found in selecting the proper boards of enrollment while there was more or less opposition general fry says it could not be said to be serious some of the officers were maltreated and one or two assassinated but prompt action on the part of the civil authorities aided when necessary by military patrols secured the arrest of guilty parties and checked these outrages those who attempted to obstruct enrollment officers were promptly punished and orders from the war department gave a clear definition of what constituted impediments to the drafts not only the assaulting or obstructing of officers was cause for punishment but even standing mute and the giving of false names subjected the offender to summary arrest in addition to the duties of enrolling all citizens capable of bearing arms of drafting from these the numbers required for military service and of arresting deserters and returning them to the army the provost marshal general was also charged with the entire work of recruiting volunteers this ensured harmony and systematic action in the two methods of raising troops and the work was carried on with constantly increasing efficiency and success 
a comparatively small number of men was obtained strictly by the draft but the draft powerfully stimulated enlistments and the money obtained by commutation furnished an ample fund for all the expenses of the bureaus of recruitment improvements in the law and the modes of executing it were constantly made until at the close of the war the system was probably as perfect as human ingenuity could make it under the peculiar conditions of american life the result proved the vast military resources of the nation in april eighteen sixty five with a million soldiers in the field the enrollment showed that the national forces not called out consisted of two million two hundred and forty five thousand more we quote the aggregates of the successive calls and their results from general fry's final report the quotas charged against the states under all calls made by the president during the four years from the fifteenth of april eighteen sixty one when his first proclamation echoed the guns at sumter to the fourteenth of april eighteen sixty five when lincoln was assassinated and recruiting ceased amounted to two million seven hundred and fifty nine thousand forty nine the terms of service varying from three months to three years the aggregate number of men credited on the several calls and put into service in the army navy and marine corps was two million six hundred and ninety thousand four hundred and one this left a deficiency of sixty eight thousand which would have been readily filled if the war had not closed in addition to these some seventy thousand emergency men were from first to last called into service during the progress of the work an infinite variety of questions arose as to the quotas and the credits of the several states and the president was overwhelmed by complaints and reclamations from various governors in the north even the most loyal supporters of the administration exerted themselves to the utmost to have the demands upon them reduced and their credits for troops furnished raised to the highest possible figures while in those states which were politically under the control of the opposition these natural importunities were aggravated by what seemed a deliberate intention to frustrate as far as possible the efforts of the government to fill its depleted armies the most serious controversy that arose during the progress of the enrollment was that begun and carried on by governor seymour of new york so long as the administration of governor e d morgan lasted the government received the most zealous and efficient support from the state of new york it is true that at the close of governor morgan's term the last day of eighteen sixty two the adjutant general reported the state deficient to some twenty eight thousand men and volunteers under the various calls of the government eighteen thousand of which deficiency belonged to the city of new york but in spite of this deficiency there had never been any lack of cordial cooperation on the part of the state government with that of the nation in the autumn of that year however in the period of doubt and discouragement which existed more or less throughout the union general james s wadsworth the republican candidate for governor had been defeated after a most acrimonious contest by horatio seymour then and until his death the most honored and prominent democratic politician of the state he came into power upon a platform denouncing almost every measure which the government had found it necessary to adopt for the suppression of the rebellion and upon his inauguration on the first day of eighteen sixty three he clearly intimated that his principal duty would be to maintain and defend the sovereignty and jurisdiction of his state the president anxious to work in harmony with the governors of all the loyal states and especially desirous on public grounds to secure the cordial cooperation in war matters of the state administration in new york had written to mr seymour soon after his inauguration as governor inviting his confidence and friendship you and i are substantially strangers and i write this chiefly that we may become better acquainted i for the time being am at the head of a nation which is in great peril and you are at the head of the greatest state of that nation as to maintaining the nation's life and integrity i assume and believe there cannot be a difference of purpose between you and me if we should differ as to the means it is important that such difference should be as small as possible that it should not be enhanced by unjust suspicions on one side or the other in the performance of my duty the cooperation of your state as that of others is needed in fact it is indispensable this alone is a sufficient reason why i should wish to be at a good understanding with you please write me at least as long a letter as this of course saying in it just what you think fit the governor waited three weeks and then made a cold and guarded reply retaining in this private communication the attitude of reserve and distrust he had publicly assumed he said i have delayed answering your letter for some days with a view of preparing a paper in which i wish to state clearly the aspect of public affairs from the standpoint i occupy 
i do not claim any superior wisdom but i am confident the opinions i hold are entertained by one half of the population of the northern states i have been prevented from giving my views in the manner i intended by a pressure of official duties which at the present stage of the legislative session of this state confines me to the executive chamber until each midnight after the adjournment which will soon take place i will give you without reserve my opinions and purposes with regard to the condition of our unhappy country in the meanwhile i assure you that no political resentments or no personal objects will turn me aside from the pathway i have marked out for myself i intend to show to those charged with the administration of public affairs a due deference and respect and to yield them a just and generous support in all measures they may adopt within the scope of their constitutional powers for the preservation of the union i am ready to make any sacrifice of interest passion or prejudice this closed the personal correspondence between them the governor never wrote the promised letter he did not desire to commit himself to any friendly relations with the president with the narrowness of a bitterly prejudiced mind he had given an interpretation to the president's cordial overture as false as it was unfavorable in an article published with his sanction many years afterwards he is represented as expressing his conviction that at the time of this correspondence there was a conspiracy of prominent republicans to force lincoln out of the white house that the president was aware of it and that this was the cause of the anxiety which he displayed to be on intimate friendly terms with mr seymour there could be no intimate understanding between two such men mr lincoln could no more comprehend the partisan bitterness and suspicion which lay at the basis of mr seymour's character than the latter could appreciate the motives which induced lincoln to seek his cordial cooperation in public work for the general welfare he gave the same base interpretation to a complimentary message which stanton sent him in june eighteen sixty three thanking him for the energy with which he had sent forward troops for the defense of pennsylvania and when a year later stanton invited him to washington for a consultation he refused either to go or to reply to the invitation thoreau weed is quoted as saying in his later years that mr lincoln after mr seymour's election and before his inauguration authorized mr weed to say to him that holding his position he could wheel the democratic party into line and put down the rebellion and that if he would render this great service to the country mr lincoln would cheerfully make way for him as his successor mr weed says he made this suggestion to seymour but that the latter preferred to administer his office as an irreconcilable and conscientious partisan it is probable that mr weed as is customary with elderly men exaggerated the definiteness of the proposition but these letters show how anxious lincoln was that seymour should give a loyal support to the government and in how friendly and self-effacing a spirit he would have met him in what must be said in regard to the controversy in which general seymour soon found himself engaged with the national government there is no question of his personal integrity or his patriotism he doubtless considered that he was only doing his duty to his state and his party in opposing almost every specific act of the national government the key to all his actions in respect to the draft is to be found in his own words it is believed he said by at least one half of the people of the loyal states that the conscription act is in itself a violation of the supreme constitutional law this belief he heartily shared and no moral blame attaches to him for trying to give it effect in his official action his conduct led to disastrous results his views of government were shown to be mistaken and unsound the nation went on its triumphant way over all the obstacles interposed by him and those who believed with him and during the quarter of a century which elapsed before his death his chief concern was to throw upon the government the blame of his own factious proceedings he constantly accused the administration of mr lincoln of an unfair and partisan execution of the law which he regarded in itself as unconstitutional he assumed that because the enrollment of the arms-bearing population of new york city which had given a majority for him showed an excess over the enrollment in the rural districts which had given a large majority for wadsworth that the city was to be punished for being democratic and the country rewarded for being republican to which the most natural reply was that the volunteering had been far more active in the republican districts than it had been in the democratic he attacked all the proceedings of the provost marshals he accused them of neglect and contumacy toward himself all these accusations were wholly unfounded general fry was a man as nearly without politics as a patriotic american can be he came of a distinguished democratic family and during a life passed in the military service his only preoccupation had been the punctual fulfillment of every duty confided to him 
the district provost marshals for the city of new york were selected with especial care from those recommended by citizens of the highest character in the place three provost marshal generals were appointed for new york and great pains were taken to choose those who would be likely to secure the favor and cooperation of the authorities and the people of new york they were major frederick townsend colonel robert nugent and major a s divin nugent was an irishman a war democrat and divin an intimate acquaintance and personal friend of governor seymour townsend was a well-known resident of albany they were specially charged to put themselves in communication with the governor to acquaint themselves with his views and wishes and to give them due weight in determining the best interests of the government and to endeavor by all means in their power to secure for the execution of the enrollment act the aid and hearty cooperation of the governor state officers and the people a letter was at the same time written to the governor by the provost marshal general commending those officers to him and asking them for his cooperation a similar letter was sent to the mayor of new york city the government exhausted all its powers in endeavoring to command the enrollment to the favorable consideration of the civil officers of the state but governor seymour says general fry gave no assistance in fact so far as the government officers engaged in the enrollment could learn he gave the subject no attention without the aid or countenance of the governor in face of his quiet hostility the enrollment was carried forward as rapidly as possible the work was impeded by numerous and important obstacles the large floating population of the city threw great difficulties in its way opposition was encountered in almost every house the enrollment officers entered where artifice did not succeed violence was sometimes attempted in some places organized bodies of men opposed the enrollment in others secret societies waged a furtive warfare against the officers but in spite of all these drawbacks the enrollment was made with remarkable fairness and substantial success it was no more imperfect than was inevitable and the draft which followed it was conducted in such a manner as to neutralize to a great extent the irregularities and hardships that might have resulted from the errors it contained the enrollment having been completed the orders for drafting in the state of new york were issued on the first of july at that date the draft had been going on for some time in new england colonel nugent was left at liberty if thought expedient to execute the draft in new york city by districts and in one or more at a given time rather than all at once throughout the city governor seymour was notified in almost daily letters from the first to the thirteenth of july of the drafts which had been ordered in the several districts the provost marshal general begged him to do all in his power to enable the officers to complete the drafts promptly effectively fairly and successfully he paid no attention to these requests further than to send his adjutant general to washington on the eleventh of july for the purpose of urging the suspension of the draft but while this officer was away upon his mission the evil passions excited in the breasts of the lowest class of democrats in new york city by the denunciations of the enrollment act and of the legally constituted authorities who were endeavoring to enforce it broke out in the most terrible riot which this western continent has ever witnessed the state of popular distrust and excitement which naturally arose from the discussion of the enrollment was greatly increased by the vehement utterances of the more violent democratic politicians and newspapers governor seymour in a speech delivered on the fourth of july which was filled with denunciations of the party in power said the democratic organization look upon this administration as hostile to their rights and liberties they look upon their opponents as men who would do them wrong in regard to their most sacred franchises the journal of commerce accused the administration of prolonging the war for its own purposes and added such men are neither more nor less than murderers the world denouncing the weak and reckless men who temporarily administer the federal government attacked especially the enrollment bill as an illegal and despotic measure the daily news which reached a larger number of the masses of new york than any other journal quoted governor seymour as saying that neither the president nor congress without the consent of the state authorities had a right to force a single individual against his will to take part in the ungodly conflict which is distracting the land it condemned the manner in which the draft was being executed as an outrage on all decency and fairness the object of it being to kill off democrats and stuff the ballot boxes with bogus soldier votes incendiary handbills in the same sense were distributed through the northern districts of the city thickly populated by laboring men of foreign birth although there had been for several days mutterings of discontent in the streets and even threats uttered against the enrolling officers these demonstrations had been mostly confined to the drinking saloons and no apprehensions of popular tumult were entertained 
even on saturday morning the eleventh of july when the draft was to begin at the corner of forty third street and third avenue there was no symptom of disturbance the day passed pleasantly away the draft was carried on regularly and good-humouredly and at night the superintendent of police as he left the office said the rubicon was passed and all would go well but the next day being sunday afforded leisure for the ferment of suspicion and anger every foreigner who was drafted became a centre of sympathy and excitement there were secret meetings in many places on sunday night and on the next morning parties of men went from shop to shop compelling workmen to join them and swell the processions which were moving to the above-mentioned office of the enrolment board the commissioner proceeded quietly with his work the wheel was beginning to turn a few names were called and recorded when suddenly a large paving stone came crashing through the window and landed upon the reporter's table shivering the inkstands and knocking over one or two bystanders and with hardly a moment's interval a volley of stones flew through the windows putting a stop to the proceedings the crowd kindled into fury by its own act speedily became a howling mob the rioters burst through the doors and windows smashing the furniture of the office into splinters sprinkling camphene upon the floor and setting the building on fire when the fire department arrived they found the mob in possession of the hydrants and the building was soon reduced to ashes this furious outburst took the authorities completely by surprise the most trustworthy portion of the organized militia had been ordered to pennsylvania to resist the invasion of general lee there was only a handful of troops in the harbor and the mob having possession of the street railways prevented for a time the rapid concentration of these while the police who were admirable in organization and efficiency being at the time under republican control were of course inadequate to deal during the first hours of the outbreak with an army of excited and ignorant men recruited in an instant from hundreds of workshops and excited by drink and passionate declamation the agitation and disorder spread so rapidly that the upper part of the city was in a few hours in full possession of the maddened crowd the majority of them filled with that aimless thirst for destruction which rises so naturally in a mob when the restraints of order are withdrawn they were led by wild zealots excited by political hates and fears or by common thieves who found in the tumult their opportunity for plunder by three o'clock in the afternoon the body of rioters in the upper part of the city numbered several thousand their first fury was naturally directed against the enrolling offices after the destruction of the building in the ninth district they attacked the block of stores in which the enrolling office of the eighth district stood the adjoining shops were filled with jewelry and other costly goods and were speedily swept clean by the thievish hands of the rioters and then set on fire here as before the firemen were not permitted to play on the flames but the political animus of the mob was shown most clearly by the brutal and cowardly outrages inflicted upon negroes they dashed with the merriment of fiends on every colored face they saw taking special delight in the maiming and murdering of women and children late in the afternoon of the thirteenth the mob made a rush for the fine building of the colored orphan asylum this estimable charity was founded and carried on by a society of kind-hearted ladies it gave not only shelter but instruction and christian training to several hundred colored orphans a force of policemen was hastily gathered together but could only defend the asylum for a few minutes giving time for the inmates to escape the policemen were then disabled by the brutal mob who rushed into the building stealing everything which was portable and then setting the house on fire they burned the residences of several government officers and a large hotel which refused them liquor for three days these horrible scenes of unchained fury and hatred lasted an attack upon the new york tribune office was a further evidence of the political passion of the mob headed at this point by a lame secessionist barber who had just before been heard to express the hope that he might soon shave jeff davis in new york and who led on the rioters with loud cheers for general mcclellan but after dismantling the counting-room they were attacked and driven away by the police colonel h t o'brien having sprained his ankle while gallantly resisting the mob stepped into a drug store for assistance while his detachment passed on the druggist fearing the rioters begged o'brien to leave his shop and the brave soldier went out among the howling crowd in a moment they were upon him and beat and trampled him into unconsciousness for several hours the savages dragged the still breathing body of their own countrymen up and down the streets inflicting every indignity upon his helpless form and then shouting and yelling conveyed him to his own door there a courageous priest sought to subdue their savagery by reading the last offices for the dying over the unfortunate colonel 
the climax of horror was reached by the brutal ruffians jostling the priest aside and closing the ceremonies by dancing upon the corpse from beginning to end they showed little courage they were composed for the greater part of the most degraded classes of foreigners and as a rule they made no stand when attacked either by the police or the military in any number the only exception to this rule was in the case of a squad of marines who foolishly fired into the air when confronting the rioters a company of fifty regulars was able to work its will against thousands of them the city government the trusty and courageous police force and the troops in the harbor at last came into harmonious action and gradually established order throughout the city the state government was of little avail from beginning to end of the disturbance governor seymour having done all he could to embarrass the government and rouse the people against it had left the city on the eleventh and gone to long branch in new jersey on the receipt of the frightful news of the thirteenth he returned to the city a prey to the most terrible agitation he was hurried by his friends to the city hall where a great crowd soon gathered and there in sight of the besieged tribune office he made the memorable address the discredit of which justly clung to him all his days his terror and his sympathy with the mob in conflict with his convictions of public duty completely unmanned him he addressed the rioters in affectionate tones as his friends and assured them that he had come to show them a test of his friendship he informed them that he had sent his adjutant to washington to confer with the authorities there and to have the draft suspended this assurance was received with the most vociferous cheers he urged them to act as good citizens leaving their interests to him wait until my adjutant returns from washington he said and you shall be satisfied the words in this extraordinary speech for which the governor was mostly blamed were those in which he addressed the mob as his friends but this was a venial fault pardonable in view of his extreme agitation the serious matter was his intimation that the draft justified the riot and that if rioters would cease from their violence the draft would be stopped he issued two proclamations on the fourteenth one mildly condemning the riot and calling upon the persons engaged in it to retire to their homes and employments and another somewhat sterner in tone declaring the city and county of new york to be in a state of insurrection and warning all who might resist the state authorities of their liability to the penalties prescribed by law it is questionable if the rioters ever heard of the proclamations and if they did the effect of these official utterances was entirely nullified by the governor's sympathetic speeches the riots came to a bloody close on the night of thursday the fourth a small detachment of soldiers met the principal body of rioters in third avenue and twenty-first street killed thirteen and wounded eighteen more taking some dozens of prisoners the fire of passion had burned itself out by this time and the tired mob now thoroughly dominated slunk away to its hiding places during that night and the next day the militia were returning from pennsylvania several regiments of veterans arrived from the army of the potomac and the peace of the city was once more secured the rioters had kept the city in terror for four days and had destroyed two millions of property for several days afterwards arrests went on and many of the wounded lawbreakers died in their retreats afraid to call for assistance there were disturbances more or less serious in other places which were speedily put down by the local authorities but as mr greeley says in no single instance was there a riot incited by drafting wherein americans by birth bore any considerable part nor in which the great body of the actors were not born europeans and generally of recent importation the part taken by archbishop hughes in this occurrence gave rise to various commentaries he placarded about the city on the sixteenth of july an address to the men of new york who are now called in many papers rioters inviting them to come to his house and let him talk to them assuring them of immunity from the police in going and coming you who are catholics the address concluded or as many of you as are have a right to visit your bishop without molestation on the seventeenth at two o'clock a crowd of four or five thousand persons assembled in front of the archbishop's residence and the venerable prelate clad in his purple robes and full canonical attire appeared at the window and made a strange speech to the mob half jocular and half earnest alternately pleading cajoling and warning them he told them that he did not see a riotous face among them he did not accuse them of having done anything wrong he said that every man had a right to defend his house or his shanty at the risk of his life that they had no cause to complain as irishmen and catholics against the government and affectionately suggested whether it might not be better for them to retire to their homes and keep out of danger he begged them to be quiet in the name of ireland ireland that never committed a single act of cruelty until she was oppressed ireland that has been the mother of heroes and poets 
but never the mother of cowards. The crowd greeted his speech with uproarious applause and quietly dispersed. The number of those who lost their lives during the riots has never been ascertained. The mortality statistics for that week and the week succeeding show an increase of five or six hundred over the average. Governor Seymour estimated the number killed and wounded at one thousand. Others placed it much higher. Naturally, in such days of terror and anger, there were not wanting those who asserted that the riots were the result and the manifestation of a widespread treasonable conspiracy involving leading Democrats at the North. The President received many letters to this effect, one relating the alleged confession of a well-known politician who, overcome with agitation and remorse, had in the presence of the editors of the Tribune divulged the complicity of Seymour and others in the preparation of the Emuet. But he placed no reliance upon the story, and there was in fact no foundation for it. With all his desire to injure the administration, Governor Seymour had not the material of an insurrectionist in his composition, and when the riot came, his excitement and horror were the best proof that he had not expected it. The scenes of violence in New York were not repeated anywhere else, if we accept a disturbance at Boston which for a time threatened to become serious, but it was put down by the prompt and united action of the civil and military authorities. But the ferment of opposition was so general as to give great disquietude to many friends of the government throughout the country. Leading unionists in Philadelphia, fearing a riot there, besought the president by mail and telegraph to stop the draft. In Chicago, a similar appeal was made, and by recruitment and volunteering, the necessity of a draft was avoided in Illinois until the next year. No provision of the enrollment law excited such ardent opposition as that which was introduced for the purpose of mitigating its rigors the provision exempting drafted men from service upon payment of three hundred dollars. The rich man's money against the poor man's blood was a cry from which no demagogue could refrain, and it was this which contributed most powerfully to rouse the unthinking masses against the draft. The money paper exemptions was used, under the direction of the provost marshal general, for the raising of recruits and the payment of expenses of the draft. It amounted to a very large sum, to twenty-six millions of dollars, after all expenses were paid, there was a remainder of nine millions left to the credit of that bureau in the Treasury of the United States. The exemption fund was swelled by the action of county and municipal authorities, especially by those of New York, who, in the flurry succeeding the riots, passed in great haste an ordinance to pay the commutation for drafted men of the poorer classes. A certain impetus was given to volunteering also, but the money came in faster than the men, and in June 1864, the Provost Marshal General reported that out of some 14,000 drafted men, 7,000 were exempted for various reasons, and 5,000 paid money for commutation. This statement was sent to Congress by the President with the recommendation that the commutation clause be repealed. This was done after a hot discussion, which exhibited a curious change of front on the question. Willard Salisbury, Richard A. Richardson, and other Democrats, energetically opposing the repeal, and making it the occasion of as bitter attacks on the administration, as those which had been for a year directed against the law. It may not be without interest to look for a moment at the measures pursued by the Confederate authorities to raise and maintain their army. There is a striking contrast between methods and results on either side of the line. The methods of the Confederates were far more prompt and more rigorous than those of the national government, while the results attained were so much less satisfactory that their failure in this respect brought about the final catastrophe of their enterprise. They began the war with forces greatly superior in numbers to those of the Union. Before the attack on Fort Sumter, their Congress had authorized the raising of an army of 100,000 men, and Mr. Davis had called into service 36,900 men, more than twice the army of the United States, and immediately after beginning hostilities, he called for 32,000 more. On the 8th of May, the Confederate Congress gave Mr. Davis almost unlimited power to accept the services of volunteers without regard to place of enlistment, and a few days later he was relieved by statute of the delays and limitations of formal calls, and all power of appointment to commissions was placed in his hand. So that, while from the beginning to the end the most punctilious respect was paid by the national executive and legislature to the rights of the loyal states in the matter of recruitment, the states which had succeeded on the pretext of preserving their autonomy speedily gave themselves into the hands of a military dictator." In December 1861, the term of enlistment was changed from one to three years, the pitiful bounty of $50 being given as compensation. During all that winter recruiting languished, and several statutes, continually increasing in severity, were passed with little effect, 
and on the sixteenth of april eighteen sixty two the confederate congress passed a sweeping measure of universal conscription authorizing the president to call and place in the military service for three years unless the war should end sooner all white men who are residents of the confederate states between the ages of eighteen and thirty-five years not legally exempt from service and arbitrarily lengthening to three years the terms of those already enlisted a law so stringent was of course impossible of perfect execution under the clamor and panic of their constituencies the confederate congress passed repealed and modified various schemes of exemption intended to permit the ordinary routine of civil life to pursue its course but great confusion and heart-burnings arose from every effort which was made to ease the workings of the inexorable machine the question of overseers of plantations was one especially difficult to treat the law of the eleventh of october eighteen sixty two exempted one man for every plantation of twenty negroes this system was further extended from time to time but owners of slaves were obliged to pay five hundred dollars a year for each exemption by one statute it was provided that on plantations where these exemptions were granted the exemption paid two hundred pounds of meat for every able-bodied slave on the plantation gradually all exemptions as of right were legislated away and the whole subject was left to the discretion of the executive which vastly increased his power and his unpopularity it finally rested upon him to say how many editors ministers railroad engineers and expressmen were absolutely required to keep up the current life in the business of the country the limit of age was constantly extended in september eighteen sixty two an act of the confederate congress authorized the president to call into service all white men resident in the confederate states between the ages of eighteen and forty five in february eighteen sixty four another law included all between seventeen and fifty which gave occasion to grant for his celebrated mott afterwards credited him by general butler that the confederates were robbing both the cradle and the grave to fill their armies severe and drastic as were these laws and unrelenting as was the insurrectionary government in their execution they were not carried out with anything like the system and thoroughness which characterized the actions of the national authorities the confederate generals were constantly complaining that they got no recruits or not enough to supply the waste of campaigns on the thirtieth of april eighteen sixty four the chief of the bureau of conscription at richmond made a report to the secretary of war painting in the darkest colors the difficulties encountered by him in getting soldiers into the ranks though he had all the laws and regulations he needed and there were men enough in the country he said and in these words confessed that the system had failed and that the defeat of the revolt was now but a question of time the results indicate this grave consideration for the government that fresh material for the armies can no longer be estimated as an element of future calculation for their increase and that necessity demands the invention of devices for keeping in the ranks the men now born on the rolls the stern revocation of all details an appeal to the patriotism of the states claiming large numbers of able-bodied men and the accretions by age are now almost the only unexhausted sources of supply for conscription from the general population the functions of this bureau may cease with the termination of the year eighteen sixty four end of chapter one chapter two of abraham lincoln a history volume seven this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org abraham lincoln a history volume seven by john hay and john george nicolay chapter two the lincoln seymour correspondence governor seymour was too thorough a partisan to undergo any change of opinion in consequence of the riotous scenes which had so shaken his own nerves and so frightfully disturbed the peace of new york on the contrary he was only the more convinced of the illegality and impolicy of the draft and at once dispatched samuel j tilden and other prominent citizens to washington to urge the president to suspend it he supplemented these personal solicitations by repeated telegrams asking that the draft be suspended until the president should receive a letter which he was preparing in this letter which was dated the third of august the governor denounced the enrollment and draft as a harsh and unfortunate measure he claimed that injustice was done in assigning the quotas that they were not in proportion to the relative population of the several districts 
and urged with the greatest earnestness and persistence that the draft should be suspended in the state of new york until measures should be taken by the courts to ascertain its constitutionality a point which the governor had already decided for himself he said in this letter that it is believed by at least one half of the people of the loyal states that the conscription act is in itself a violation of the supreme constitutional law and in a tone of sullen menace he warned the president against persisting in the enforcement of the law i do not dwell he said upon what i believe would be the consequence of a violent harsh policy before the constitutionality of the act is tested you can scan the immediate future as well as i he then demanded that the enrolling officers should submit their lists to the state authorities and that an opportunity should be given him as governor to test the fairness of the proceedings he left entirely out of view in this letter the fact that he had been repeatedly invited and urged to cooperate with the enrolling officers and thereby ensure the fairness of their action the tone of this letter was not calculated to inspire the president with confidence in the good will or the candor of governor seymour but although he recognized in the governor's attitude that of a determined political opponent he chose in replying to take his adversary's good faith for granted and throughout the entire correspondence which ensued the courtesy as well as the fairness of the president is noticeable after acknowledging the receipt of seymour's letter the president said i cannot consent to suspend the draft in new york as you request because among other reasons time is too important he accepted the figures of the governor as proving the disparity of the quotas in relation to the population much of it however he said i suppose will be accounted for by the fact that so many more persons fit for soldiers are in the city than are in the country who have too recently arrived from other parts of the united states and from europe to be either included in the census of eighteen sixty or to have voted in eighteen sixty two still he did not insist upon this natural explanation of the disparity but conceded the governor's claim without further discussion reducing the quarter where it seemed by the governor's showing to be excessive to the average of the districts not complained of he then said he should direct the draft to proceed in all the districts ordering a re-enrolment in those whose quota had been reduced he also promised that the governor should be informed of the time fixed for commencing the draft in each district he continued i do not object to abide a decision of the united states supreme court or of the judges thereof on the constitutionality of the draft law in fact i should be willing to facilitate the obtaining of it but i cannot consent to lose the time while it is being obtained we are contending with an enemy who as i understand drives every able-bodied man he can reach into his ranks very much as a butcher drives bullocks into a slaughter-pen no time is wasted no argument is used this produces an army which will soon turn upon our now victorious soldiers already in the field if they shall not be sustained by recruits as they should be it produces an army with a rapidity not to be matched on our side if we first waste time to re-experiment with the volunteer system already deemed by congress and palpably in fact so far exhausted as to be inadequate and then more time to obtain a court decision as to whether a law is constitutional which requires a part of those not now in the service to go to the aid of those who are already in it and still more time to determine with absolute certainty that we get those who are to go in the precisely legal proportion to those who are not to go my purpose is to be in my action just and constitutional and yet practical in performing the important duty with which i am charged of maintaining the unity and the free principles of our common country 
but the governor was not in a frame of mind to accept this fair and practical treatment of the subject even while the president was writing the governor was sending him notice of a still more elaborate and partisan statement which had been prepared by his judge advocate general accusing the enrolling officers of shameless frauds which he said will bring disgrace not only upon your administration but upon the american name and on the following day having received the president's letter of the seventh governor seymour wrote again regretting the president's decision urging anew the advantages of the system of volunteering over the draft and calling attention to what he termed the partisan character of the enrollment he claimed that in nineteen republican districts the quotas were too small and that in nine democratic districts they were too large you cannot and will not fail he said to right these gross wrongs in spite of these insulting charges the president did not lose his equanimity and good temper he did not even suggest as general fry does that the war had then been going on about two years and its early demands had skimmed off the cream of the nation's loyalty and very naturally most men would be found remaining in those districts which were most unfriendly to the war or the manner in which the government conducted it he answered with patient courtesy on the eleventh of august saying to the governor that in view of the length of his first statement and the time and care which had been taken in its preparation he did not doubt that it contained the governor's entire case as he desired to present it he had answered it therefore supposing that he was meeting governor seymour's full demand laying down the principle to which he proposed adhering which was to proceed with the draft at the same time employing infallible means to avoid any great wrongs he therefore arbitrarily reduced the quotas of several additional districts to the minimum heretofore adopted although his demands were thus substantially conceded nothing could mitigate governor seymour's hostility to the execution of the law general dix who had been appointed to the command of the department of the east with headquarters in new york city had asked the governor as early as the thirtieth of july whether the military power of the state might be relied on to enforce the execution of the law in the case of forcible resistance to it he was anxious he said for perfect harmony of action between the federal and state governments and if he could feel assured that the governor would see to the faithful enforcement of the law he would not ask the war department to put united states troops at his disposal for that purpose four days later he received a reply from the governor saying that he believed the president would take such action as to relieve both of them from the painful questions growing out of an armed enforcement of the conscription law the general answered in a letter giving expression to his disappointment at the tone of the governor's letter and receiving no further communication from him he applied to the secretary of war on august fourteenth for a force adequate to maintain public peace this call was promptly answered and troops sufficient to preserve public order against any attack were sent him after the call had been made the governor informed him that as there could be no violations of good order which were not infractions of the laws of the state these laws would be enforced under all circumstances and that he should take care that all the executive officers of the state should perform their duties vigorously and thoroughly and that if need be the military power would be called into requisition and on the eighteenth of august he issued a proclamation saying that while he believed it would have been a wise and humane policy to procure a judicial decision with regard to the constitutionality of the conscription act at an earlier day and by a summary process that the failure to do this in no degree justified any violent opposition to the act of congress he warned all citizens of the state to abstain from riotous proceedings and to rely on the courts for redress of their wrongs it was probably due to the energetic action of the government the presence of ten thousand veteran troops from the army of the potomac and the recollection left on the minds of the turbulent classes by the clubs of the policemen a month before 
rather than to the half-hearted proclamation of the governor that when the draft was resumed on the nineteenth of august no resistance was offered governor seymour however continued an active campaign by mail and telegraph against the proceeding protesting at every stage that the apportionments were unfair that the demands upon new york were excessive and the credits allowed the state and city inadequate the enormous bounties which had been paid by towns and counties proved an irresistible temptation to dishonest men almost every criminal out of the penitentiary betook himself to the comparatively safe and lucrative business of bounty jumping the anxiety for recruits was great and it was almost impossible to counteract the ingenuity and duplicity of bounty brokers in working rascals into the service the discipline of the recruiting officers was lax desertion speedily followed enlistment and the same nimble rogue might figure under different names in the credits claimed from a dozen districts this rascality especially flourished in the crowded wards of the city of new york so fast as enlistments were reported however informally from any district governor seymour wanted a corresponding reduction of the quotas and he also demanded that every new yorker enlisted in another state should be credited to his own this last demand was so patently unreasonable that the president refused it after consulting the judge advocate general of the army with all reasonable demands for credits he tried his best to comply on the sixteenth of august he sent the following dispatch to governor seymour your dispatch of this morning is just received and i fear i do not perfectly understand it my view of the principle is that every soldier obtained voluntarily leaves one less to be obtained by draft the only difficulty is in applying the principle properly looking to time as heretofore i am unwilling to give up a drafted man now even for the certainty much less for the mere chance of getting a volunteer hereafter again after the draft in any district would it not make trouble to take any drafted man out and put a volunteer in for how shall it be determined which drafted man is to have the privilege of thus going out to the exclusion of all the others and even before the draft in any district the quota must be fixed and the draft might be postponed indefinitely if every time a volunteer is offered the officers must stop and reconstruct the quota at least i fear there might be this difficulty but at all events let credits for volunteers be given up to the last moment which will not produce confusion or delay that the principle of giving credits for volunteers shall be applied by districts seems fair and proper though i do not know how far by present statistics it is practicable when for any cause a fair credit is not given at one time it should be given as soon thereafter as practicable my purpose is to be just and fair and yet to not lose time during the entire summer and autumn governor seymour and his friends made the proceedings of the government in relation to the enrollment law the object of special and vehement attack on the seventeenth of october the president made a call for three hundred thousand volunteers and at the same time ordered that the draft should be made for all deficiencies which might exist on the fifth of january following on the quotas assigned to districts by the war department shortly after this the democratic state committee issued a circular making the military administration of the government and especially the law calling for troops the object of violent attack greatly exaggerating the demands of the government claiming that no credits would be allowed for those who had paid commutation and basing these charges upon a pretended proclamation of the twenty seventh of october which had never been issued the president with the painstaking care which distinguished him prepared with his own hand the following contradiction of this misleading circular the provost marshal general has issued no proclamation at all he has in no form announced anything recently in regard to troops in new york except in his letter to governor seymour of october twenty one which has been published in the newspapers of that state 
it has not been announced nor decided in any form by the provost marshal general or any one else in authority of the government that every citizen who has paid his three hundred dollars commutation is liable to be immediately drafted again or that towns that have just raise the money to pay their quotas will have again to be subject to similar taxation or suffer the operations of the new conscription nor is it probable that the like of them ever will be announced or decided the circular we have referred to went on claiming that the state had been thoroughly canvassed and that the victory of the democratic ticket was assured but the result showed that the democratic leaders were as far wrong in their prophecy as in their history the republican state ticket was elected by a majority of thirty thousand over the democratic and the principal state of the union decided the vehement controversy which had raged all the year between seymour and lincoln in favor of the president a verdict which was repeated in the following year when governor seymour was himself a candidate for re-election in the early part of december the president anxious in every way to do justice and to satisfy if possible the claims of governor seymour consented to the appointment of a commission to inquire into the whole subject of the enrolment in new york the principal member of the commission chosen by governor seymour was william f allen of new york his intimate friend and an ardent democrat in politics of the other members general john love of indiana was also a democrat chauncey smith of massachusetts was a lawyer not prominently identified with either political party judge allen clearly dominated the commission and they agreed with him in condemning the principle on which the enrollment and draft were conducted they reported that instead of numbering the men of a given district capable of bearing arms and making that number the basis of the draft which was the course the enrolling officers in direct obedience to the law of congress had pursued the quota should be adjusted upon the basis of proportion to the entire population they did not endorse the injurious attacks made by the governor upon the enrolling officers and agents but distinctly stated that their fidelity and integrity was unimpeached the essential point of their report was simply that the quota should be in proportion to the total population of the district and not according to the number of valid men to be found in it when the president required from the provost marshal general his opinion upon the report general fry made this reasonable criticism the commission has evidently been absorbed by the conviction that the raising of men is and will necessarily continue to be equivalent to levying special taxes and raising money and they would therefore require the same proceeds under the enrollment act from a district of rich women which they would from a district with the same number of men of equal means i assume that we are looking for personal military service from those able to perform it that we make no calls for volunteers in the sense in which the commission understands it but that we assign to the districts under the enrollment act fair quotas of the men we have found them to contain the president entirely agreed with the provost marshal general that it was manifestly unjust to require from a district whose young men had been depleted by the patriotic impulse which filled the army at the beginning of the war as many drafted men as were justly called for from those who had contributed nothing to the field a course which would have been the logical result of yielding to the demands of governor seymour and the recommendation of the commission but wishing to make all possible concessions to the state authorities he resolved once more to reduce the quota of new york and explained his action in a letter to the secretary of war dated february twenty seventh eighteen sixty four in the correspondence between the governor of new york and myself last summer i understood him to complain that the enrollments in several of the districts of that state had been neither accurately nor honestly made and in view of this i for the draft then immediately ensuing ordered an arbitrary reduction of the quotas in several of the districts wherein they seemed too large and said after this drawing these four districts and also the seventeenth and twenty ninth shall be carefully re-enrolled and if you please agents of yours may witness every step of the process 
in a subsequent letter i believe some additional districts were put into the list of those to be re-enrolled my idea was to do the work over according to the law in presence of the complaining party and thereby to correct anything which might be found amiss the commission whose work i am considering seem to have proceeded upon a totally different idea not going forth to find men at all they have proceeded altogether upon paper examinations and mental processes one of their conclusions as i understand is that as the law stands and attempting to follow it the enrolling officers could not have made the enrolments much more accurately than they did the report on this point might be useful to congress the commission conclude that the quotas for the draft should be based upon entire population and they proceed upon this basis to give a table for the state of new york in which some districts are reduced and some increased for the now ensuing draft let the quotas stand as made by the enrolling officers in the districts wherein this table requires them to be increased and let them be reduced according to the table in the others this to be no precedent for subsequent action but as i think this report may on full consideration be shown to have much that is valuable in it i suggest that such consideration be given it and that it be especially considered whether its suggestions can be conformed to without an alteration of the law so long as governor seymour remained in office he continued his warfare upon the enrolment act and the officers charged with its execution on the eighteenth of july eighteen sixty four the president made a third call for troops under the act and the governor promptly renewed his charges and complaints at this time however both he and mr lincoln were candidates before the people the one for the presidency and the other for the governorship of new york and it was probably for this reason that mr seymour's correspondence was carried on at this time with the secretary of war instead of mr lincoln but it afforded no new features there were the same complaints of excessive quotas of unfair unequal and oppressive action as before he said again that there had been no opportunity given to correct the enrollment upon which the provost marshal general reported that the governor had been duly informed of the opportunities to make corrections and that an order had been issued from his own headquarters in reference to the matter no efforts were spared by the government to ensure a rigid revision of the lists the governor spoke with great vehemence of the disparity between the demands made upon new york and boston saying that in one of the cities twenty six per cent of the population was enrolled and in the other only twelve and a half per cent general fry replied to this that the proportion of enrollment to population in boston was not twelve and a half but sixteen point nine two per cent that less than seventeen per cent in new york and brooklyn were enrolled and that in fine the enrollment was a mere question of fact it was the ascertainment of a number of men of a certain description in defined areas that the enrolments were continuously open to revision and that any name erroneously on them would be stricken off as soon as the error was pointed out to the board of enrolment by anybody he then showed that the quotas throughout new york were in fact smaller than in many other states where the proportion of men was large and closed his report by saying that he saw no reason why the law should not be applied to new york as well as to the other states this report mr stanton transmitted to the governor expressing the somewhat sanguine trust that it would satisfy him that his objections against the quotas assigned to new york were not well founded he recalled the fact that a commission was appointed the previous year with a view to ascertain whether any mistake or errors had been made by the enrolling officers but that the commissioners bore their testimony to the fidelity with which the work was done that with a view to harmony the president had directed a reduction in some districts but without the increase of others recommended by the commissioners and that a basis for the assignment being now absolutely fixed by act of congress the war department had no power to change it in reply to governor seymour's demand for the appointment of another commission the secretary declined it on these grounds 
first because there is no fault found by you with the enrolling officers nor any mistake fraud or neglect on their part alleged by you requiring investigation by a commission second the errors of the enrolment if there be any can readily be corrected by the board of enrolment established by law for the correction of the enrolment third the commission would not have nor has the secretary of war or the president power to change the basis of the draft prescribed by the act of congress fourth the commission would operate to postpone the draft and perhaps fatally delay strengthening the armies now in the field thus aiding the enemy and endangering the national government the voters of new york in the autumn election decided to retire governor seymour to private life and his successor governor reuben e fenton gave to the government during the rest of the war a hearty and loyal support the provost marshal general in his final report of march seventeenth eighteen sixty six presents some important considerations concerning the conscription they are substantially as follows the conscription was not presented as a popular measure but as one of absolute necessity it was difficult to convince the drafted man whose family depended on him for support that a law was wise which forced him to enter the military service or that the board of enrolment had not done injustice in refusing to exempt him the opponents of the measure were prompt to render pretended sympathy and encourage opposition by misrepresenting facts magnifying real causes of hardship or creating imaginary grievances where real ones were wanting the action of civil courts was invoked and the officers enforcing the law were subjected to harassing litigation and in many instances fines were imposed upon them for acts done in their official capacity pursuant to the orders of superior and competent authority notwithstanding these difficulties the duty was satisfactorily discharged when the bureau was organized the strength of the army was deemed insufficient for offensive operations the inadequacy of the system of recruiting previously pursued had been demonstrated a new system was therefore inaugurated by the general government assuming the business which had previously been transacted mainly by the state governments the functionaries provided by the enrollment law were made united states recruiting officers springing directly from the people and at the same time exercising the authority and representing the necessities and wishes of the government they reached the masses and were able without abating the requirements of the conscription to promote volunteering and to forward recruits as fast as they could be obtained the quotas of districts were made known each locality was advised of the number it was required to furnish and that in event of failure the draft would follow the result was that one million one hundred and twenty thousand six hundred and twenty one men were raised at an average cost on account of recruitment exclusive of bounties of nine dollars and eighty four cents per man while the cost of recruiting the one million three hundred and fifty six thousand five hundred and ninety three raised prior to the organization of the bureau was thirty four dollars and one cent per man in addition to the duties of recruitment the law required the provost marshal to arrest deserters wherever they might be found and seventy six thousand five hundred and twenty six were arrested and returned to the ranks the provost marshal general compared for the purpose of great wars the system of recruitment by volunteer enlistments stimulated by bounties with the system of compulsory service through enrollment of the national forces by the direct action of the general government and their draft if volunteering failed he said that a plan of recruitment based upon the bounty system will necessarily be more expensive than any other and as a rule produce soldiers of an inferior class and although bounty is unquestionably calculated to stimulate recruiting it does not always accomplish that object at the proper time for when it is visible as it was during the late war that in the anxiety to obtain recruits the bounties offered constantly increased the men who intend to enlist at one time or another are induced to hold back with the hope at a later day of receiving higher compensation and having to serve for a shorter period 
in time of peace enough recruits to meet the requirements of the service can usually be procured without the aid of bounty and in time of war the country can least afford the cost besides needing the service of better men than those who enter the army simply from mercenary motives the provost marshal general regarded the enrollment act of eighteen sixty three and its amendments with some slight improvements which he suggested as establishing a military system adequate to any emergency which the country is ever likely to encounter under the wise and patient guidance of president lincoln the delicate duties of this bureau novel to our country and possessed of almost unlimited powers were successfully performed the rights of citizens duly considered and personal liberty always respected the careful attention which the president himself gave to the complicated and vexatious business of enrollment and draft is indicated by the report of a committee appointed by the legislature of rhode island to confer with him concerning the quota of that state the committee said the president at this point interrupted the committee to say that complaints from several states had already been made to the same effect and in one instance the subject had been so earnestly pressed upon his attention that he had personally taken the pains to examine for himself the formula which the provost marshal general had adopted for the calculation and distribution of the quota for the different states and had arrived at the conclusion that it was impossible for any candid mind to doubt or question its entire fairness the president further stated that the plan that had been adopted by the provost marshal general for the assignment of the respective quotas met his entire approval and appeared to him to be the only one by which exact justice could be secured while the controversy between the government and its opponents in regard to the enrollment and the draft was going on the president disappointed and grieved at the persistent misrepresentations of his views and his intentions by those of whom he thought better things were to be expected feeling that he was unable by the power of logic or persuasion to induce the leaders of the democratic party to do him justice or to cooperate with him in the measures which he was convinced were for the public good thought for a time of appealing directly to the people of the united states in defence of the conduct of the government he prepared a long and elaborate address which he intended most especially for the consideration of the honest and patriotic democrats of the north setting forth with his inimitable clearness of statement the necessity of the draft the substantial fairness of its provisions and the honesty and the equity with which as he claimed the government had attempted to carry it out but after he had finished it doubts arose in his mind as to the propriety or expediency of addressing the public directly in that manner and it was never published it is for the first time printed in this work and from mr lincoln's own manuscript and it is a question whether the reader will more admire the lucidity and the fairness with which the president sets forth his views or the reserve and abnegation with which after writing it he resolved to suppress so admirable a paper it is at all times proper that misunderstanding between the public and the public servant should be avoided and this is far more important now than in times of peace and tranquillity i therefore address you without searching for a precedent upon which to do so some of you are sincerely devoted to the republican institutions and territorial integrity of our country and yet are opposed to what is called the draft or conscription at the beginning of the war and ever since a variety of motives pressing some in one direction and some in the other would be presented to the mind of each man physically fit for a soldier upon the combined effect of which motives he would or would not voluntarily enter the service among these motives would be patriotism political bias ambition personal courage love of adventure want of employment and convenience or the opposite of some of these we already have and have had in the service as appears substantially all that can be obtained upon this voluntary weighing of motives and yet we must somehow obtain more or relinquish the original object of the contest together with all the blood and treasure already expended in the effort to secure it to meet this necessity the law for the draft has been enacted 
you who do not wish to be soldiers do not like this law this is natural nor does it imply want of patriotism nothing can be so just and necessary as to make us like it if it is disagreeable to us we are prone too to find false arguments with which to excuse ourselves for opposing such disagreeable things in this case those who desire the rebellion to succeed and others who seek reward in a different way are very active in accommodating us with this class of arguments they tell us the law is unconstitutional it is the first instance i believe in which the power of congress to do a thing has ever been questioned in a case when the power is given by the constitution in express terms whether a power can be implied when it is not expressed has often been the subject of controversy but this is the first case in which the degree of effrontery has been ventured upon of denying a power which is plainly and distinctly written down in the constitution the constitution declares that the congress shall have power to raise and support armies but no appropriation of money to that use shall be for a longer term than two years the whole scope of the conscription act is to raise and support armies there is nothing else in it it makes no appropriation of money and hence the money clause just quoted is not touched by it the case simply is the constitution provides that the congress shall have power to raise and support armies and by this act the congress has exercised the power to raise and support armies this is the whole of it it is a law made in literal pursuance of this part of the united states constitution and another part of the same constitution declares that this constitution and the laws made in pursuance thereof shall be the supreme law of the land and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby anything in the constitution or laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding do you admit that the power is given to raise and support armies and yet insist by this act congress has not exercised the power in a constitutional mode has not done the thing in the right way who is to judge of this the constitution gives congress the power but it does not prescribe the mode or expressly declare who shall prescribe it in such case congress must prescribe the mode or relinquish the power there is no alternative congress could not exercise the power to do the thing if it had not the power of providing a way to do it when no way is provided by the constitution for doing it in fact congress would not have the power to raise and support armies if even by the constitution it were left to the option of any other or others to give or withhold the only mode of doing it if the constitution had prescribed a mode congress could and must follow that mode but as it is the mode necessarily goes to congress with the power expressly given the power is given fully completely unconditionally it is not a power to raise armies if state authorities consent nor if the men to compose the armies are entirely willing but it is a power to raise and support armies given to congress by the constitution without an if it is clear that a constitutional law may not be expedient or proper such would be a law to raise armies when no armies were needed but this is not such the republican institutions and territorial integrity of our country cannot be maintained without the further raising and supporting of armies there can be no army without men men can be had only voluntarily or involuntarily we have ceased to obtain them voluntarily and to obtain them involuntarily is the draft the conscription if you dispute the fact and declare that men can still be had voluntarily in sufficient numbers prove the assertion by yourselves volunteering in such numbers and i shall gladly give up the draft or if not a sufficient number but any one of you will volunteer he for his single self will escape all the horrors of the draft and will thereby do only what each one of at least a million of his manly brethren have already done 
their toil and blood have been given as much for you as for themselves shall it all be lost rather than that you too will bear your part i do not say that all who would avoid serving in the war are unpatriotic but i do think every patriot should willingly take his chance under a law made with great care in order to secure entire fairness this law was considered discussed modified and amended by congress at great length and with much labor and was finally passed by both branches with a near approach to unanimity at last it may not be exactly such as any one man out of congress or even in congress would have made it it has been said and i believe truly that the constitution itself is not altogether such as any one of its framers would have preferred it was the joint work of all and certainly the better that it was so much complaint is made of that provision of the conscription law which allows a drafted man to substitute three hundred dollars for himself while as i believe none is made of that provision which allows him to substitute another man for himself nor is the three hundred dollars provision objected to for unconstitutionality but for inequality for favoring the rich against the poor the substitution of men is the provision of any which favors the rich to the exclusion of the poor but this being a provision in accordance with an old and well-known practice in the raising of armies is not objected to there would have been great objection if that provision had been omitted and yet being in the money provision really modifies the inequality which the other introduces it allows men to escape the service who are too poor to escape but for it without the money provision competition among the more wealthy might and probably would raise the price of substitutes above three hundred dollars thus leaving the man who could raise only three hundred dollars no escape from personal service true by the law as it is the man who cannot raise so much as three hundred dollars nor obtain a personal substitute for less cannot escape but he can come quite as near escaping as he could if the money provision were not in the law to put it another way is an unobjectionable law which allows only the man to escape who can pay a thousand dollars made objectionable by adding a provision that any one may escape who can pay the smaller sum of three hundred dollars this is the exact difference at this point between the present law and all former draft laws it is true that by this law a somewhat larger number will escape than could under a law allowing personal substitutes only but each additional man thus escaping will be a poorer man than could have escaped by the law in the other form the money provision enlarges the class of exempts from actual service simply by admitting poorer men into it how then can the money provision be a wrong to the poor man the inequality complained of pertains in greater degree to the substitution of men and is really modified and lessened by the money provision the inequality could only be perfectly cured by sweeping both provisions away this being a great innovation would probably leave the law more distasteful than it now is the principle of the draft which simply is involuntary or enforced service is not new it has been practised in all ages of the world it was well known to the framers of our constitution as one of the modes of raising armies at the time they placed in that instrument the provision that the congress shall have power to raise and support armies it had been used just before in establishing our independence and it was also used under the constitution in eighteen twelve wherein is the peculiar hardship now shall we shrink from the necessary means to maintain our free government which our grandfathers employed to establish it and our own fathers have already employed once to maintain it are we degenerate has the manhood of our race run out again a law may be both constitutional and expedient and yet may be administered in an unjust and unfair way this law belongs to a class which class is composed of those laws whose object is to distribute burdens or benefits on the principle of equality no one of these laws can ever be practically administered with that exactness which can be conceived of in the mind a tax law the principle of which is that each owner shall pay in proportion to the value of his property will be a dead letter if no one can be compelled to pay until it can be shown that every other one will pay in precisely the same proportion according to value 
nay even it will be a dead letter if no one can be compelled to pay until it is certain that every other one will pay at all even in unequal proportion again the united states house of representatives is constituted on the principle that each member is sent by the same number of people that each other one is sent by and yet in practice no two of the whole number much less the whole number are ever sent by precisely the same number of constituents the districts cannot be made precisely equal in population at first and if they could they would become unequal in a single day and much more so in the ten years which the districts once made are to continue they cannot be remodelled every day nor without too much expense and labour even every year this sort of difficulty applies in full force to the practical administration of the draft law in fact the difficulty is greater in the case of the draft law first it starts with all the inequality of the congressional districts but these are based on entire population while the draft is based upon those only who are fit for soldiers and such may not bear the same proportion to the whole in one district that they do in another again the facts must be ascertained and credit given for the unequal numbers of soldiers which have already gone from the several districts in all these points errors will occur in spite of the utmost fidelity the government is bound to administer the law with such an approach to exactness as is usual in analogous cases and as entire good faith and fidelity will reach if so great departures as to be inconsistent with such good faith and fidelity or great departures occurring in any way be pointed out they shall be corrected and any agent shown to have caused such departures intentionally shall be dismissed with these views and on these principles i feel bound to tell you it is my purpose to see the draft law faithfully executed End of chapter two